Now tonight I want you to turn with me to the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. And the Lord said, Go and tell this people. First there was comprehension, then conviction, then confession, then cleansing, and then came the challenge. The challenge for all of us Christians we've already heard from John is to see God clearly as he is, to see the world as God sees it, and then to step out in faith to make a difference. Verse 8 reads, then notice it only happened once Isaiah had gotten his relationship with God straightened out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And why did God ask that question? There are two reasons. The first reason God asked that question is because he wants men and women to come to know him. But they will never come to know him if they do not hear the gospel. God looks out on this world that is in rebellion against him and alienated from him and it breaks his heart. He's not content to stand back and allow the world to continue on its way to a Christless eternity. He's already speaking to people in China. He's already speaking to people in Russia. He's already speaking to people in the Middle East in ways that you and I would be absolutely amazed if we knew about. We got a letter just about three weeks ago. This uh, woman is teaching school in China. And she wrote, and told this little story. She said, the other day, I went out with two Japanese teachers. They asked me to go up on a mountain. It took us two days. And on the way, we passed by an old beggar sitting there, and something about him touched my heart, and it seemed that God whispered to me, go speak to him. But I didn't do it. I decided to wait till I came back. And sure enough, as I came back, he was still there. And I went over and I spoke to him. And I told him about Jesus Christ, and tears came to his eyes. He said, you know, I've been talking to him all my life, but I didn't know his name. You see, the Lord is revealing himself to people out there that you never dreamed of. I meet people in many parts of the world where the gospel is not allowed to be proclaimed outside of a church, perhaps or un under some severe restrictions, that tell me that they listen to Transworld Radio or Far East Broadcasting, or they have read a tract. I'm, I know a man who was Surgeon General of his country. He was walking down the street, and a piece of paper stuck to his shoe. And uh, when he got home, he pulled it off and sort of disgust, but it was about the gospel. He read it, he became a Christian, and he became a great Bible teacher in his country. Somebody had left a tract. And there's all kinds of things that God is doing that we're not aware of. It doesn't have to be a big meeting. It doesn't have to be on television and on the radio or all these big things that we think, uh, or it doesn't have to be a church building. God is at work. It's estimated in China today that there are between 30 and 50 million Christians. When the missionaries left, when the missionaries left in the late 40s, there was estimated to be 700,000. Where did they come from? What happened in China? This great revival that has taken place in the last few years in China with no preaching, no literature, no radio, no television, no nothing. 
the Holy Spirit began to work. One person would live the life in front of the people that they worked with. And people would come and ask them, what is the difference in your life? You don't get drunk and you don't do this and you don't do that. And there's a difference in your life. And little house groups began to meet, small groups here and there. And then through the Cultural Revolution, they went to prisons and they suffered. And they did all, you cannot imagine what happened to them. But they didn't break and they didn't bend. They stood for God. And now today, we may be seeing God do something great. Don't believe that we ought to get on the plane and all rush over to China as missionaries and all that. I think they can do it on their own. They've already proved it with God's help. And I think God is going to do it in China. Oh, we can help. We can go out as teachers and engineers and we can be there. And we can be a supporting group by prayer. And we ought to pray for all the Christians in China and those that are on the verge of becoming. But let's let the Chinese do it. They can do it at the present time. Maybe the day will come when it might be well that they can send some missionaries to us. And we can send some there. But let's don't even use the word missionary when we're talking about China. I've been studying a lot about China because I'm going in April. And my wife was born and reared in China. And uh, so we, uh, China is very close to us and very much on our hearts. Yes? And then the second reason God asked the question, who will go, is that God's message demands messengers. The Bible says, how then shall they call on the one whom they have not believed in, and how can they believe in one of whom they have not heard, and how can they hear without someone preaching to them, and how can they preach unless they be sent? You have those that are being sent, the sending people, but you have to have the verbalization. Now that's something that's very hard to understand in what is going on in China today, because there has been verbalization. It's been in a different way than preaching as we think of preaching, but it's been there. And it's all over the world. And we thank God that we're living in the midst of a great spiritual awakening. And the people that have the burden to reach these hidden people. And now the urbanization. I've spent most of my life in the big cities. And in the preparation period of which we have a year to two years of preparation in a city, we have seen almost everything there is to see of the burdens and the problems, the homeless, the poor, the abused, I could tell you stories just of this Christmas that we saw ourselves in New York City that you wouldn't believe. Or going to a soup line in Washington, just a few blocks from the Capitol, and seeing these people who are called the hidden people, hidden right in our midst. And one of the great mission fields of the world is America, because the people of other parts of the world are coming to us. Did you know that in Los Angeles County and, and Orange County, there are now over 400 Korean churches. And uh, did you know that Caucasian people are now a minority in Los Angeles County? And that's happening everywhere. Did you know that in London, England, there are now 400 mosques? And there are many people that think that Britain will go Islamic and other parts of Europe, it sounds strange to our ears that things can take place like that. That's a mission field. The urban areas of our world that Ray Bakey is so burdened about and has so much to say about and knows so much about, and he'll be talking to you about it. Yes, and we see people today fighting each other in the Middle East, the injustice in South Africa, the drugs, the poor, the discriminated against in Central America and South America. But God sees all of these people through the compassion of his eyes and his love and the power of the cross. And he wants to reach them and he's chosen you and me to go reach them. Will you accept the challenge of the world as it is and the challenge of God as he sees the world and the people in it? The need of the world is God's call. When I see the needs out there, that's call enough for me. But I have another call that's stronger. I have the command of Christ. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. And I had to think that through before I went to the Soviet Union the first time to preach the gospel. I was invited to a peace conference 
Well, I knew that when I got back from that peace conference, I'd be torn apart in the American press and by many of my friends. But I began to scratch my head and think. If I go to that peace conference, they've told me that they'll open the door for me to come and tour the Soviet Union preaching the gospel. I'm going to take them at their word and I'm going to trust them at that point. But I put in my peace address plenty of gospel so that people could be converted. And then I went to certain churches that they allowed me to preach in and they said, oh, the American press said, oh, that church was filled with KGB agents. I said, I hope so. They're the ones I was hoping to reach. But when the Lord said to go all the world, I don't read where he says go to the capitalist nations only. He said go to a whole world, whatever their politics, whatever their ideology. There are people, there are people lost and in need of Christ. And that's the great motivation that motivates us. And Isaiah responded, hear him, I send me. God had not promised Isaiah that it would be easy or glamorous or romantic. Oh, I know, it's great to get on a boat or a plane and get over to some other place. We feel like somehow as we land or as we're flying that God is going to fill us with his spirit and give us everything we should do and give us all the power on the flight. And when we get there, we'll be totally different. Listen, if you're not winning people to Christ here, if you're not witnessing here, if you're not serving Christ here, he can't use you there. You must do it here first on your campus, in your place. God is calling on us to do something unique in our generation. Marcel Marceau said this, if you want to make an impact on America, you have to do something unique. He was referring to the entertainment world. But God is calling us to do something unique, to deny ourselves and take up the cross and follow him out among the masses of people that need Christ. He's calling us to consider his call before our careers, to wrestle in prayer over the mission he has for us in life. God is calling us to look at the world and see it as he sees it and answer the question, who will go for us and who will go? Just before World War I, a young man arrived in Cairo, Egypt. He was 25 years old, a graduate of Yale University and Princeton Seminary. He was tall, handsome, athletic, intelligent, single, and very rich. His name was William Borden, and he was the heir to one of America's great fortunes. But he had turned his back on all the privilege and all the luxury and all the money, and he had given his money away and was on his way to China as a missionary. But shortly after arriving in Cairo, he became ill with cerebral meningitis. And in a matter of days, he was dead. And many students back here ask, was it worth it? Later, his biographer said of him that Borden said, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. It had no place in his dedication to the Lord. What about you? Think of it. No reserve, not holding back anything. No retreat, never turning back from the path God had set before him. No regrets. There are a thousand things you can do with your life, a thousand ways you can spend it, but how many of them will enable you to say at the end of your life that you have no reserve, no retreat, and no regrets? There's only one way you can truly say that, and that's to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ.